Do you remember the Lin Sanity era? If so, you know how wild of a time that was. Jeremy Lin was a Taiwanese American basketball player that was first considered to be really a bench warmer. However, when he was sent to the New York Knicks in 2011, he became one of the most unexpected stars and not just in the NBA, but in all of sports. Beginning in 2012, Lin lit up the sports world from earning career highs in points and assists to outscoring in a matchup against Kobe Bryant to making a game-winning shot against the Toronto Raptors. Lin was front and center of what seemed to be a Knicks resurgence and everyone was talking about Jeremy Lin, creating the era known as Lin Sanity. Simply put, Lin had the whole world in his hands. But just as quickly Lin rose to stardom, Lin Sanity became irrelevant after 26 games when he was traded to Houston. After jumping around numerous teams, Lin now plays for the new Taipei Kings of the P-League. Again, if you were part of this era during this time, then you understand how wild Lin Sanity was. Unfortunately, his story is all too common in various types of sports, and NASCAR is not exempted from these types of careers. So let's take a look at some of NASCAR's Lin Sanity moments. Jamie McMurray 2010 Jamie McMurray began his Cup Series career in an unusual manner, replacing the injured Sterling Marlin in the number 40 Chip Ganassi Dodge. After competing in 64 Xfinity races from 2000 to 2002 with 14 top 10s, not much was expected for the Missouri native, but in just his second Cup Series start, the unthinkable happened. In one of the biggest upsets in NASCAR history, Jamie McMurray held off Cup Series champion Bobby Labonte to win his very first Cup Series race. But while it was sure as hell quick, it would take a long time for him to see victory lane again. In fact, you'd have to go five years later and with a new team at Roush Racing in 2007 at Daytona. He would follow that up with another win two years later at Talladega. However, Roush released him and the number 26 team at the end of the season due to NASCAR's 14 limit. As a result of this, McMurray decided to ask former boss Chip Ganassi for another chance, following his disappointing era at Roush Racing, and Ganassi decided to give him another shot, granting him a contract to let him drive for his merged team with Dale Earnhardt Incorporated, now called Earnhardt Ganassi Racing. And boy did he start off with a bang! winning the Daytona 500 in his 8th appearance and the first 500 win for Ganassi. He followed that up with 3 second place finishes in the Coke 600, South of 500 and nearly won at Talladega but lost it to Kevin Harvick. However, he would get payback on Harvick by beating him at the greatest racetrack in the world, Indianapolis, leading 16 laps to win the Brickyard 400, becoming one of only 3 drivers in NASCAR history to win the Daytona 500 and Brickyard 400 in the same year. The other two drivers are Hall of Famers Dale Jarrett and Jimmy Johnson. Talk about a league company. Unfortunately, McMurray did not make the chase for the NASCAR championship. However, he would not go out without a fight. He would cap off the season with a third win at Charlotte Motor Speedway, the site of his first cup win. In 2010, he ended it with three wins, nine top fives, 12 top tens, and four pulls. However, in the years that followed, Jamie immediately became an afterthought. The next seven years as a full-time cup driver, he would only see victory lane one more time at Talladega in the fall of 2013, before racing only part-time in the Daytona 500 in 2019 and 2021 before calling it a career. Eric Amarola, 2018. Eric Amarola spent his early years in NASCAR hopping around different teams and was not taken seriously by many. Even Joe Gibbs Racing took him out of the car while he was leading and dominating an Xfinity race at Milwaukee for Denny Hamlin just to please sponsor Rockwell Automation. After a strong 2011 Xfinity season with Junior Motorsports, he was finally able to secure a sponsor with Smithfield and landed a full-time ride at Richard Petty Motorsports in 2012. Outside of a great run at Kansas in the fall of that year, not much would be seen by AA until the 2014 Coke 0400 at Daytona when he would win his first Cup Series race in a rain delay. But the next three years after that win would be nothing but mid-pack results and to add insult to injury, injured his back at Kansas in 2017. However, following the departure and retirement of Danica Patrick at the end of 2017, a spot was lined up for him with help from Smithfield at Stuart Haas Racing, one of the top teams of the sport in that time. But many people still had doubts as to whether or not Eric would show speed in the 10 car. 
considering the five years of what happened with that 10 team. But he would quickly silence those doubters. He started the season by nearly winning the biggest race, the Daytona 500, and was half a lap away from winning until Austin Dillon decided to commit murder. But he remained extremely consistent in 2018, even having a great run at Chicago, leading a race high 70 laps, a third place finish a few races later at New Hampshire, and all of that helped him secure a spot in the playoffs. After just barely getting into the round of 12, he took his second career win at Talladega after Kirk Busch decided to be a good teammate and gave him the win to advance into the round of 8. And his round of 8 results wasn't bad at all, with an average finish of 7.6 but was unable to make it into the championship four. But he did end the season fairly well, with the win, four top fives, 17 top tens, a 12.8 average finish, and finished a career high fifth in points. And considering the drivers that he beat to place that high in points, that's a very impressive season for his first time at Stuart Haas Racing. Although he would have a solid performance two years later in 2020, he would not have any success and consistency like any other season than the one that he had in 2018. His 5th place points finish would be the only time he would finish inside the top 12 before retiring full time in 2023. Although he was able to secure a win at New Hampshire in 2021, outside of 2018, Eric Amarillo would never show any signs of consistent performance in a season. Juan Pablo Montoya 2009 Juan Pablo Montoya is one of the greatest drivers of our generation. In every single type of car he's competed in across various series, he's won. But in the mid-2000s when he announced he'd be leaving Formula 1 for NASCAR, it sent shockwaves across the racing world as it was extremely rare for anyone to make that type of jump and the story was worldwide considering what Montoya had accomplished up to that point. He joined Chip Ganassi Racing at a time when the team was falling apart performance wise and on top of that dealing with the ill handling Dodge Avenger. He did earn his first win in his rookie season but it was at a road course at Sonoma. He ended 2007 and 2008 20th and 25th in points respectively, earning only 5 top 5s and 9 top 10s. But in 2009, with the merger of Dale Earnhardt Incorporated, the switch to Chevrolet and ECR engines, and on top of that, a new crew chief in Brian Patty saw Montoya not just be good at one time, but even a championship contender. The regular season saw him score 2 top 5s and 12 top 10s, including nearly winning the 2009 Brickyard 400, which he led the most laps with 116 out of the 160, but lost it due to speeding on pit road, which Montoya swears he didn't do. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this is the first time I've ever heard a driver on the radio actively call for NASCAR's murder. Regardless, with all that out of the way, he did manage to make the chase, positioning himself in the 11th seed, and started out the best way, winning the pole at Loudoun and leading 105 laps to a third place finish. In fact, the first four races of the chase, he finished third, fourth, fourth, and third again, putting him in third place 51 points behind the points leader. After Kansas, people had Mark Martin, Jimmy Johnson, and Montoya as the three drivers that would contend for a championship. But after Charlotte when he received damage and had to carry an ill handling car even spinning out at one point would we'll see him finish 35th and would we'll see him drop from 3rd to 6th losing 144 points on leader Jimmy Johnson. He would rebound next week at Martinsville for 3rd place but would only fall apart for the final 4 races finishing inside the top 15 only one time. He would end his 2009 season with 7 top 5s, 18 top 10s, 388 laps led and a 12.8 average finish. Three of those four stats, by the way, would be career highs. While in 2010, he would go back to victory lane at Watkins Glen and improve his average finish by 11.6, Montoya would never see the consistent success for the next four years of his cup career before leaving at the end of 2013, as he would finish no better than 17th in points in those final four years. Alan Kowicki, 1992. Okay, how does this make sense? How was Alan's 1992 season considered a Lynn Sanity moment? To understand that, we have to look back before 1992. Allen began driving in the NASCAR Cup Series full time in 1987, driving for his own team. But from 1987 to 1991, Allen's career can be summed up in one word. Meh. I mean, not really, considering driving for his own team was an extremely difficult task. In his first year, he earned 3 top 5s and 9 top 10s to a 15th place points finish. The next 4 years, he would be a mid-pack driver and team, having flashes of great runs, including a win at Phoenix in 88, Rockingham in 90, and Bristol in 91, but was never considered to be a consistent winning team, much less a championship winning team. 
That is why 1992 was so special. No one in their right mind had this guy and this team with the word champion next to it. But he would win two times in 1992 at Bristol and Pocono, winning six poles, the most of any driver, and earning 11 top fives and 17 top tens. But what made him stand out from the rest was his consistency. He had the best average finish out of any driver with 10.6, and in the final six races, while the other championship contenders like Elliott and Allison were falling over themselves, Kowicki outclassed them all by avoiding trouble, earning bonus points, and finishing out strong. All that culminated in the impossible being possible. The Underbird team of Allen defeating Allison after he crashed out early and beating out Junior Johnson's team and Bill Elliott to win the 1992 Cup Series Championship by just 10 points. Unfortunately, we would not get to see how much more success Allen could have had. In the first five races of 1993, he would have two top fives and three top tens and was sitting ninth in points. But tragedy would strike on April 1st, 1993, when Kowicki and three others were killed in a plane crash en route to Bristol Motor Speedway, and what followed was the saddest and most gut-wrenching laps in all of NASCAR, as everyone stood in silence to a gloomy day in Bristol, Tennessee, watching Alan Toller make the final few laps before departing the Speedway, never returning to a NASCAR race ever again. Ryan Newman, 2003 Ryan Newman is an interesting character in NASCAR. Dubbed the Rockin' Man for being godlike when it came to qualifying, winning 51 poles in total, a record that has still not yet been broken. But entering the new millennium, Newman was considered one of NASCAR's next top stars along the lights of Jimmy Johnson and Kurt Busch. He even beat Jimmy Johnson to win Rookie of the Year, winning 6 poles, the Winston, and a win at New Hampshire, including 14 top 5s, 22 top 10s, and a 6th place points finish. But in 2003, Newman lit up the scene. In what usually drivers suffer called a sophomore slump, Newman started off something like that. But he started up upside down following a crash in the Daytona 500. But after that, he was on another level. He would see victory lane 8 times that year, 17 top 5s, 22 top 10s, and a record number 11 poles all in one year. Unfortunately, he would still finish 6 in points due to inconsistency, especially with his 6 DNFs. But after that year, Newman would look for sure to have an incredible career. However, little did we know, this would be as good as it gets. Now don't get me wrong, Newman went on to have more success, winning the Daytona 500 in 2008 and the Brickyard 400 in 2013, and his surprising playoff run in 2014 that saw him finish second in points, but his stats after 2003 drastically decreased. In 2002 and 2003, Newman would go to victory lane 9 times. From 2004 to 2021, he would go to victory lane 9 times. 2004 would be the final year he would receive more than 10 top 5s in a season. Now again, Newman's career is not bad by any means, but to have a season that he had in 2003 and what happened after surely makes this a Lynn Sanity moment. Kyle Petty, 1992 Being the son of one of the greatest drivers in NASCAR history will always be tough. While Kyle Petty is probably known to new NASCAR fans for his time on TV, in 1992, he was a championship contender. Driving for Felix Sabatis in his iconic mellow yellow Pontiac, his 1992 campaign was really the only year in his near 30-year driving career where he actually showed true championship driving skills. He would go on to win two times that year at Watkins Glen and Rockingham, earning 9 top 5s, 17 top 10s, and 3 poles. And in the final four races, he was one of the championship contenders fighting with Kowicki, Davey Allison, and Bill Elliott. However, a 19th and 16th place finishes in the final two races following Rockingham ended Petty's chances of being a championship contender. While 1993, Petty would once again finish fifth in points, earning only one win, his performance dipped and Petty would never see the success that he created with that team in 1992. He would only go to victory lane one more time in 1995, but finishing an abysmal 30th in points even not qualifying for a race at Bristol. From 95 until his retirement all the way in 2008, he would only finish inside the top 20 one time in points in 1997. He would never see victory lane again following 95 and would never have an average finish higher than 22nd. Elliott Sadler, 2004 Elliott Sadler's career can be summed up in one phrase, always a bridesmaid but never the bride. His Xfinity Series career from 2011 to 2018 has been nothing but stellar in terms of consistency and always being in championship contention. But if you were to ask about his cup career, well, you'd be asking how he was able to have a cup ride for so long. 
His first four years from 1999 to 2002, he drove the legendary Wood Brothers number 21 car, but he's really only remembered for two moments. One for having a blowover at Michigan in 2000, and in 2001 when he took the 21 car to victory lane for his first cup career win at Bristol, but he would never finish higher than 20th. In 2003, he would go to Robert Yates Racing in the number 38 M&M's Ford. That year would be remembered for one thing, a blowover again, this time at Talladega. But in 2004, something was different. He started by finishing in the top 10 in the Daytona 500, and six races later, he would hold off a hard-charging Casey Kane to win his second Cup Series victory at Texas. Throughout the regular season, he consistently remained 6th to 8th in the point standings, and further backed it up with another win at the penultimate race of the regular season at Fontana. He entered the chase as a 6th seed, and started out the first 5 races earning 3 top 10s and 1 top 5, and was sitting 4th in points following Charlotte. However, the final 5 races he fell apart, finishing outside the top 30 in 4 of the 5 races, finishing the year with 2 wins, 8 top 5s, 14 top 10s, and an 11.7 average finish and finishing 9th in points. But that year would be his best year in Cup. From 2005 until 2010, the last year he'd be in the Cup Series, he would never see victory in lane, would only finish in the top 5 just 5 times between those years, would finish 22nd or worse in his last 5 years in Cup and the point standings, and would have an average finish of 17th or worse. Derek Cope 1990 Derek Cope nowadays gets memed to oblivion and is justified considering the things he has been involved in, but you'd be surprised to know that not only has he gone to victory lane, but he has won the Daytona 500. In 1990, Cope was running in second place when Dale Earnhardt entered the final corner on the final lap having a tire go down, only Cope to sneak by and win the race in one of the biggest upsets in NASCAR history. But it was no fluke. 10 races later at Dover, leading 93 of the 500 laps, Cope took the number 10 car back to victory lane for his second and what would be his final Cup Series win. He would finish the year with those two wins, two top fives, which were his two wins, and six top tens, finishing 18th in points. The reason why he's on this list was because although he didn't have a good season, he did win the Daytona 500, something only 41 other drivers in the history of NASCAR can say. But the next 328 races of his career, he would only finish in the top 5 4 times, and the top 10 just 21 times, with the final time he finished in the top 10 was 8th at Atlanta in November of 1997. But at the end of the day, he has this, and you and I don't have a damn thing. So who's laughing now, really? But anyways, that's it for this video of NASCAR's Lynn Sanity Seasons. Do you agree with my list? And let me know in the comment section down below your thoughts on this video and if you have any other seasons that come to your mind. Don't forget to leave a like and subscribe for more content. And as always, until next time, my name is Jet. Thanks for watching.